Welcome to How It's Done. We are doing part three of our series on the Restored Church of God. And today we have a special guest all the way from Portland, Oregon. We have Dennis Steele, who has been a um, minister for the Worldwide Church of God for 26 years. He's a former minister, and he's here to give us uh, some insight of his past. And also our current topic that we've been going over is the Restored Church of God. We also, we have Mark back with us. Um, he's going to elaborate on some things in between. So welcome, Dennis. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity today. Well, good morning and uh, greetings from Portland, Oregon. So getting into it, could you give us a little overview on the history of Herbert Armstrong, who established the Radio Church of God, which ended up becoming the Worldwide Church of God, and how you got involved? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, the church had quite a beginning here in Portland. Um, just by happenstance, Herbert Armstrong lived here in Portland uh, in the 1920s and started um, the Radio Church of God here in Portland in Eugene, Oregon. Um, that was in the 1940s. I discovered the church. I was 14 years old in the 1960s. I always thought I was supposed to be a church pastor. Um, it was the 60s. I mean, we had Vietnam, we had the Middle East, we had presidents assassinated to a teenager it seemed like well the second coming of christ was just around the corner and um i was listening to the broadcast from the worldwide church of god with garner ted armstrong and i just got uh, hooked line and sinker i went to their college um, when i was 18 and by the time i was 22 they had uh, sent me into the field ministry um, and I was there for 26 years. I pastored in 14 different churches, five different states, and um, lasted about 26 years, and that was 25 years ago. So uh, I went on when I finally left in the 90s um, to develop a therapeutic massage practice in Portland and Greenville, South Carolina, and I've been doing that for 25 years. But it, it hooked me. It was the 60s, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. And uh, it seemed to make sense at the time. You couldn't have talked me out of it. I grew up uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church. I'm from Rochester, New York. And our college of choice in my youthful church would have been Calvin College in Michigan, which is very conservative fundamentalist church as well. Can I, can now, I ask you all mentioned, of that? I'm sorry, Don. I just uh, wanted you to mentioned the Ambassador College. That is specific to Worldwide Church of God, correct? Right. Uh, that's in Pasadena. And I went there for four years and um, allegedly studied theology, but that's not really what happens at Ambassador College. Um, you become a very good Bible reader. I was a good Bible reader when I showed up there at 18 years old. Um, the Dutch Reformed Church has its kids memorizing entire chapters of the Bible from second grade on. So, um, you know, I'm very familiar with, with the Bible. And uh, it is that familiarity, actually, which took me further out of it eventually. But um, yeah, Ambassador College, um, in, my, in hindsight, was merely a institution that supported uh, Herbert Armstrong's view of the world, of the Bible. He was not a trained scholar. He was not trained in theology. But he did hit the airwaves at just the right time in the 1930s, where um, radio preaching became very popular. And he had a charisma that went with it, as did his son. But his training was very minimal. It was all his opinion. Um, and the college was basically there to support his opinions. The ministry, in hindsight, myself included, was simply a salesman for whatever Herbert Armstrong thought the Bible meant. And over the years, and it took a little too long for me, uh, sadly mistaken, the Bible does not mean what the Worldwide Church of God meant, nor does it mean with the restored church of God meant? Mark, you had something to say? I'd like to ask Dennis just a little bit more detail about what was appealing to you at the Worldwide Church of God. You said you joined when you were 14. Was that your parents pulled you into it or you heard it and thought this is really interesting? No, oh, no, I, I, it was all me. My parents uh, were Presbyterian. I actually uh, smuggled my application to Ambassador College under my parka in the winter of uh, 
68. And um, anyway, long story short with that, eventually, after by maybe the next four years when I was in college, my parents actually also came into the church, as did, as did my sisters, nieces. Um, and I think that was more in hindsight. That's just the family just kind of stayed together. And so, uh, uh, yeah, but I went there on my own and I would have gone there, you know, my dad told me, he said, I'll pay for your college anywhere east of the Mississippi, which meant I won't pay for it if you go to that school. But eventually my father ended up becoming a, a local church elder in the Worldwide Church of God. And uh, when Dave Pack was the pastor in Rochester, um, you know, my family had quite a, quite a relationship with him. My parents used to babysit his children. And he took my parent, my dad, all over the state of New York visiting. Now you went uh, to the Ambassador College. Um, who are some of the people that you went to college with? Um, and you mentioned in a, a previous conversation um, that you also attended with David Pack, David C. Pack, who um, runs Restored Church of God. Yes. Um, Mr. Pack was two years ahead of me. So I went there when I was 18. I knew him when he was 20. Uh, I've also, you know, experienced him as a pastor of my parents' church uh, and um, in Chicago in a brief time during Chicago, when I was in Chicago, um, encountered him somewhat. But certainly uh, D Dave has left a trail in his ministry that most ministers in the Worldwide Church of God were well aware of. And it was not something to be proud of. Uh, he's a very uh, um, dominating personality, as many uh, one-man show churches have. That's why they're one man, that that one person gets to make the rules, decide what the beliefs are, and you can like it or lump it. So, um, uh, but I went to Ambassador College by myself. I didn't, I knew nothing about the college the day I walked up on the campus. Um, I just read the literature. I never went to a local church before I went to Ambassador College. Now, I did have a, my older sister and her husband had previously come into Worldwide Church of God and were also at Ambassador College. Uh, he was a forest ranger in Boise, Idaho, which is where I first encountered the church on a visit to them when I was 14. And uh, he eventually went into the ministry as well um, for decades. So I actually had three church pastors in the family um, through the years, four church pastors. Now, David Pack has told um, many people that uh, he had a very close relationship with Herbert Armstrong, and there's mixed reviews. Some people believe yes, um, and it's been confirmed by family that, you know, he would call David Pack, um, and they would discuss for hours, but on his bio on the Restored Church of God page, which it seems more of an autobiography if you read it, um, that he had a close relationship with Herbert Armstrong and that people were jealous of that. That's possible. Um, I mean, I believe that he did. I believe, you know, when he says Herbert Armstrong would call him, I think the family has confirmed that they would talk. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Peck has a tendency to exaggerate uh, just about everything. So whether it was hours, could have been minutes. But I also have a very close friend who was very deep on the inside of the church with Mr. Armstrong, uh, who told me just two weeks ago, he said, well, I was at a meeting in Mr. Armstrong's office when uh, Mr. Pack called. And after talking with him for a while and then finally hung up to resume the meeting, Mr. Armstrong said, why does that man keep calling me? Uh, he would like it to stop. So that's sort of perhaps the indication that whatever relationship there was, it eventually soured and, and was mm, too, too much. Now, Herbert Armstrong now, was this around the time that uh, Herbert Armstrong was still in the church or after? Uh, he was still alive. As long as he was alive, he was the church. And uh, yeah, so it would have been during that particular time. And, and in the late 1970s, when the church went into a receivership, Herbert Armstrong basically fled to Tucson, Arizona to avoid uh, inquiry by the state of California. Uh, I'm not privy to how that all worked, but I know that um, he did end up living uh, in Tucson 
for a number of years just because it was a very difficult situation to be in the state of California for him. Could you explain exactly what that was, what California did and why? Well, several members, as, as again happens in many churches, uh, that finally the abuses begin to rack up, the rumors, the scandals. It was very difficult. I, it was very difficult for me to be a pastor in the church because of all the scandals, all the difficulties. Uh, I really just wanted to be a church pastor. I really loved the people. I didn't particularly care for the ministry um, for many reasons. I tended to work in small churches by myself. Uh, I pastored Finley, Ohio. I started a church in Mansfield, Ohio. I worked in Toledo, Ohio. My kids grew up at Cedar Point. Um, so I'm very familiar with that. But um, the state Finally, the pressure got so much as to what was going on with the finances, the state of California actually put them in receivership until they could straighten it out. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Of course, um, it was all persecution against the church. Every church that has people looking at them askew says, you're persecuting us when really we're just observing that something is very wrong. Money is being totally misspent, uh, no accountability. And even as Mr. Pack tells his church, once you give the money, it's none of your business what he says God does with it and his servants. Well, of course, God doesn't need money, but his servants do. So Dave is really saying once you send money to the church, I decide what happens to it. It's none of your business. And Herbert Armstrong was the same way. So in effect, Dave Pack was following the Herbert W. Armstrong way of dealing with the money you know, being a former member, I used to hear that you give the money to God and you let the church handle it, and then we're responsible for it. Yeah. The I problem is, is that when there's no accountability, then they can do whatever they want to with it. And then there are questions about how much, you know, where is the money going? Is it going to preach the gospel? And if they're not actively preaching the gospel, where's all the money? Where's the money from 2020 for AYC that they raised? almost a hundred thousand dollars and the camp didn't happen that year. And yet the money didn't go back to the people who gave it. I would want to know if I were a state or federal agency, you said you raised this money for a camp that didn't happen. Where did it go? And as a member in that church, you can't even ask if you ask that you're shown the door. Right. Right. Now that's true. That's absolutely true. And you know, even the church would check on the ministry to see if they were tithing on their own, on their income. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a good, re good way to get fired, I think, if you weren't returning 10% of your pastoral salary back to the church. And it wasn't that great a salary. Not, not on my account, it wasn't. Also, Herbert Armstrong was finally questioned because he started going all around the world, talking to world leaders. It was a big deal about the coming kingdom, but he would uh, couch it in terms where he didn't offend anybody. Uh, he had uh, the, the habit of handing out very expensive Stuben crystals, uh, crystal gifts to all the world leaders. And there's many, many stories about how world leaders used him as well. Uh, as far as getting money, sure, I'll talk to you. It'll cost you so much. And he would take it and pay it um, because it looked good in the Plain Truth magazine. It looked like he, you know, Ferdinand Marcos, he had a relationship meeting him. Well, we know. Ferdinand wasn't exactly on the up and up. Um, all the in Israel are very common to have relationships in Israel because um, uh, that's where you know Jesus was going to return to, and you want to have connections in Israel. Uh, but a lot of money was wasted. The church had its own Gulfstream II aircraft, which again is very common among uh, evangelical uh, radio ev or TV evangelists. You know they don't want to travel publicly they want to travel their own way well, these planes cost millions of dollars not only to buy but to service and he flew all over the world at the expense of um, the average person that was a member and very often there was no accountability you know and and also there was no benefit to these uh, particular meetings nothing came from them it was like an ego trip uh, at least from my perspective now, how was it being a minister for the Worldwide Church of God? What, what different types of things did you experience, good and bad? Well, I enjoyed my people. I enjoyed the church. I'm a people person. 
Um, I'm not a controller. I listen. I like counseling. Um, I, I did not, as a pastor, always teach uh, or give sermons on some of the things the church supposedly believed because I didn't believe them from the beginning. I never gave a sermon on British Israelism. Um, it didn't matter to me. Uh, it's not in the New Testament. You know, equality of uh, access to, to the Bible was, was not based on whether you were a member of one of the lost 12 tribes, which is uh, pretty questionable too. Um, but I never gave a sermon on that. I never, uh, the church taught a place of safety, restored Church of God teaches the same. Dave has adopted that particular belief, and that is someday the word will go out to flee to wherever Mr. Pack thinks they should flee to. The church always said it was in Jordan, Petra, Jordan. Terrifying, absolutely terrifying uh, uh, practice and teaching. Not biblical. It's a mishmash of scriptures they put together. Uh, when I was young in the ministry, I vowed, boy, if that day ever comes, I'm not I'm not telling that to the church. That's insane. And that was back during the days of Jim Jones and David Koresh. So, um, you know, how stupid can, can people be? But Mr. Pack teaches that. And um, uh, it's a little, that's a little frightening. I never gave a sermon on divorce and remarriage. Church had views about, you know, if you were married previous to coming into church and then you remarried, you were probably married to the other person and not the one you're with. So you have to separate. Mm -mm. I never taught that. I never gave a sermon on that. I never separated anybody because it's just, uh, I don't care in that sense. I don't care what the Bible seems to teach. It can also be seen to teach something else about that. Um, so, so what about um, in like restored church of God, how uh, if you were already married an interracial marriage, it was okay for them. But if you're not married and you're in the church, you're not supposed to do interracial marriage. Was that uh, an issue with Worldwide Church of God and racism in the beginning? Yes, uh, you know, absolutely. Segregation, before I went to college, but in the 50s and early 60s, even at the church festivals, there were separate places where all the uh, black people would sit. Um, it, it, the church, in hindsight, was very racist. Uh, the doctrine teaching of British Israelism lends itself to that. Uh, restored church of God. I don't know their beliefs on if you come to the church and you're already racially married, mixed marriage. Uh, I'm sure they don't condone it. Um, if you're not married and you, and you find somebody that you want to marry uh, that is not of your race. So that, that whole teaching of British Israelism is racist. And um, the early church of God in hindsight was very racist. It was, it was a long time before there was ever a black pastor. It was only when I was in college that they had five black students, five men, five women come to the college. And that was because it was starting to get, um, you know, known that you can't do that. You have to have, uh, you can't, you can't keep people out. Uh, Bob Jones University, where I lived very close to in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, they had those problems as well. Very racist. And that was a product of Bob Jones, uh, the original Bob Jones, who was a contemporary of Herbert Armstrong. It was a sign of those times, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, so some now of the, the doctors... most controversial of Armstrong's positions, and you touched on it a little bit, is his teaching on the Anglo-Israelism, a doctrine that affirms that England and the United States are what is left of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. And it says the church taught that the United States and Britain um, were heirs to God's covenant with Israel. Could you explain that? Boy, that's a tough one <laughs> because I never <laughs> believed it. You I know not what it. you ask. Well, I never gave a sermon on it. I didn't like it. It, it didn't, you know, you go through the whole New Testament, go ahead and try to find that uh, any of that's true or even important. It's not important. Um, but that, uh, British Israelism goes back to the 1800s, and uh, that was very popular back then, to the point where even, you know, when archaeologists would discover the mound builders in Ohio, well, it wasn't mound builders. It couldn't be Native Americans that built those. They're too stupid. So it had to be Israelites. But that was a very common belief in the 1800s. Um, it is not true that uh, Israel or that uh, the 12 lost tribes are to be found in the United States. Um, 
and Britain, uh, basically it's white European nations are the 12 lost tribes, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, but Netherlands, France, um, not Germany. Those are the Assyrians. <laughs> so uh, it gets very complicated. And I, I, I just never gave a sermon on it because uh, I didn't care. And I, I don't care to this day. It's not important. And Mark, you have something to add? Uh, just two points of clarification. Um, I don't want to be the RCG police, but the, one of the points about I, I personally never experienced what I would call abject racism in the restored church of God. However, since I am a white male, I have my white privilege. It's probably blinding me to the facts behind that. But specifically about marriages, whatever state you came in, whether you were interracial or not, the church did not break up marriages. It's only when you wanted to date. And then regarding the place of safety, that teaching was, I guess you could say, done away with as far as Restore Church of God is concerned. They get, got rid of that when they got rid of what's called, they refer to now as the Big T, which is the understanding of Revelation as Herbert W. Armstrong taught it. Dave Pack established the Restore Church of God saying we're upholding to what Herbert Armstrong taught and yet has dismantled pretty much many of their teachings, especially the prophetic teachings. So the place of safety is not where the folks in Wadsworth are, are going to flee to. It's that the kingdom of Israel and then the kingdom of God comes to the earth here and that that fleeing happens later. So just, just two points of clarification. Okay, Dennis, how did the transition to product, productism <laughs> uh, from the Worldwide Church of God and the rise of the splinters affect you and your family? Hmm. Well, it um, pretty well destroyed it. Um, it was a difficult transition. Transition when you lose faith in faith, which I was beginning to question not just the church, which was a burden. Uh, it was causing me undue depression, anxiety. Uh, you get into the mode of what's going to happen next. And then, of course, this comes along with this uh, change from uh, a Seventh-day church. Let's flip it back to a Sunday keeping, Christmas keeping church, which I came from. I grew up that way. So I wasn't about to go back and reinvent my own wheel. Uh, I wasn't interested in that. But on top of that, I was also coming to see that I don't think the Bible is quite the book I was always told it was. To, it was. So, uh, you know, I have become very skeptical. Um, in that transition, uh, there was divorce. I take responsibility for that. I was under a lot of pressure. Um, my way of handling things, whatever that meant, there was no support. It was all do it yourself. You know, there's uh, no support. You couldn't trust anybody. That was my experience in uh, South Carolina. Um, a lot of backstabbing. And, and I'm just not used to that. So, you know, there was a divorce, which, again, I accept responsibility for. Um, my transition was uh, very difficult for me personally. You don't just walk away from your beliefs. You can lose faith in faith, but it takes time. And um, it, it's very difficult. And so, um, you know, I, I went through counseling. I also was um, asked to be on the uh, counseling team, so to speak, um, from Dan Barker, who started uh, an organization. He wrote the book, losing faith in faith because he used to be a pastor too and he went through the same thing and I was helping encourage church pastors who realize usually at midlife that they don't want to be pastors um, for many number of reasons but the price of leaving is incredibly high and the chance of you maintaining your family is small of keeping everybody on the same page is very small uh, my counselor told me personally, he said, you can, you've only got two choices, Dennis. He said, you can go back to where you came from. Everybody will love you, praise you, pat you on the back and support you, but you'll never be able to speak up again. Or you can leave the church, the box that you're in, which you've already done. And then he paused and then he said the most true thing I've ever heard. He said, but you will go alone. And that's, that's what happens. So it, I, it very difficult. Uh, transition. Um, parts of it I'm not proud of, but that's just the way it goes. You know, life is what life does what it does. I didn't sign up for the Church of God. 
I use the analogy, I went to play hockey and somewhere along the line, somebody said, not only are we not playing hockey, but we're gonna take down the, the, the nets, we're gonna melt the ice, we're gonna put up a basketball court and you're gonna be the coach. And I don't like basketball. So that's my analogy, I, I couldn't do it. Plus the fact that I have um, concluded myself that the Bible um, is, is being misused and it, um, I, I guess I would classify myself as agnostic atheist. And that is because I feel that I know much more now about the Bible than I was ever, ever taught at Ambassador College. A denominational college is going to teach you denominational spin, and they're not going to teach you things that a good college that will teach you where the Bible comes from, what it's all about, who wrote it, who didn't write it, what the politics of it is. They'll teach you that, but not at a denominational school. They have too much um, at stake. That's why you sign... Um, agreement with church creeds, you know, you stray outside this box, um, you can't work here. And I, I don't do boxes real well anymore. Now, when uh, did you leave the ministry and why specifically? Well, actually, I was terminated before I had the courage or at least it arrived at that point where I said, I, I can't do this. I, I had mentally, but it's not easy to take that final step. But my church in South Carolina, I had, I had bumped up with, um, you know, conversions and church growth um, to about 450 people. And when the changes came along and with all the different scandals and there were people outside the church mailing, you know, the inside story to everybody, it was very difficult. And so gradually the church went from 450 down to about 100 and that's when they said that to me that, it, that they didn't want to pay a minister just to pastor 100 people. So they would um, go ahead and have the local church elders do that. And thanks for your service. You can call the personnel office and they'll tell you what to do. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was just amazing. And, I, and uh, uh, But it was a relief. It was a relief because I cared for the people that I pastored and to get up and say, I'm leaving you that also goes against my grain. So the church did me a favor by moving on me first before I had to say, I, I can't do this anymore. So basically after the passing of Herbert Armstrong is when pretty much the church did a 180, things changed. It, it, was, it wasn't maybe five or six years, um, you know, where it sort of cruised along uh, as whatever normal was. But that, that began to fall apart. Herbert Armstrong was opposed to picking anybody to, to um, follow up from his uh, death. I'm sure the whole time I was in the ministry, he didn't think he was going to die before Jesus returned. I'm sure Mr. Pack thinks he's going to live to see the second coming, which I guess now is next Monday. So, uh, you know, for the 20th time that he's uh, calculated and been sadly mistaken, which he can never admit to. 20, so, that's very generous, Dennis. Yeah, well, you know him better than I do because you were you were in the thick of it. I, I could say a lot, but I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> well, I watched a very interesting documentary um, in regards to um, the changing of Worldwide Church of God, how it went about. And it gave a little bit of a back history. And it mentioned that, you know, Armstrong felt very strongly that, you know, when coming was going to come before he passed away but made a comment that you know if he passed before it did then it's the bible's fault and ain't real i believe that you know and that that's where he wouldn't pick anybody because he thought uh, as mr pack does that i'm i'm the guy you know uh, there was a, a pastor that was sent around to the churches for years and all he was was a salesman for herbert armstrong um and i hated to see him coming to my local churches but um he would always come and, you know, Mr. Armstrong would live to be when Jesus Christ returned. I never believed that. Everybody dies. He was old, you know. What are we going to do in the transition? Do you have a plan? And the answer was no. But I asked him one time, I said, what are you going to say when Herbert Armstrong dies? And the man looked me in the eye and he said, I'll believe it after three days and three nights. And I just shook my head and realized this is done. <laughs> this is done. Um, and then, of course, uh, Joseph Takach Sr. was uh, picked to take on 
uh, the Worldwide Church of God. It was through him that the changes came about. Um, I had lunch a couple of days ago with uh, his son, Joe DeCotch Jr., who uh, lives here in uh, Oregon, and we made amends. Uh, I consider him a, a very good friend. And we talked for four hours. I asked him every question I ever wanted to ask somebody that really knew what was going on. And he answered them humbly and politely. And, you know, it, it was the end of 25 years of me, in some ways, misunderstanding what happened um, because I didn't have that kind of contact, but uh, now I do. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was very difficult, very difficult. Now, tell us about the blog that you have um, that you're associated with. I have written for a little over a decade on um, Band HWA. That's run by a personal friend of mine down in Los Angeles, uh, B A N N E D H W A. Uh, that's been around. That's kind of the premier site for people to share their thoughts about what's going on with all the splits and the splinters and the slivers, uh, remnants of the church. I've kind of gotten away from that. Um, I've said about everything I can say. People there either really appreciate what I have to say or they call me names. <laughs> <laughs> Being a former pastor, you can't ever get away from it. You know, it's it's you pastors, you were this way, you were that way. I wasn't, but a lot of people project their personal experience onto the only guy that comes on that site with his real name and his real background. Uh, so it's been an experience. It's been good for me to learn to take a lot of criticism. And again, I've put my beliefs or lack of belief on that site as a result of my going through the whole process of uh, losing faith in faith, which I think is a good phrase. You know, a lot of people I know, I, I, I understand it because I was this way, but I, I believe real strongly that there are many people that are very piously convicted. They really believe what they believe, and it's based on marginal information. It's emotional, and I don't, I don't do emotional. I want to know what really happened and what the facts are. So I don't, I don't find faith to be uh, something, uh, if somebody says, well, you're a great man of faith, that's not a compliment to me. Because even the Bible, you know, Hebrews says, no, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which really is saying faith is made up of that which we hope is true, based on no evidence that it is true. That's what faith is. It's believing in that which isn't provable. And I don't think that way. And it took me a long time to realize that I, I need more than that, that doesn't work for me. And, and I, you know, the church had the doctrine of uh, divine healing where you didn't go to a doctor, you just got divinely healed, anointed, and God either healed you or he didn't. I never gave a sermon on that. I took people to the hospital. I said, get yourself taken care of. But I also know ministers that did and told people, you know, if you go to the hospital or a doctor, you, you don't have any faith in God and they died. I don't have any record like that to have to think, wow, what was I thinking? But I know a lot of ministers that do. That's what one of the things was in the documentary that I found interesting and that I've read throughout the internet is that um, Herbert Armstrong preached about not needing medical care, vaccines, things like that. But later on in life, he had health issues. So he had to seek medical care. That's one of the things that I have noticed with Restored Church of God is David Pack has not said, you cannot go, don't go to the doctor. Um, but it's like an underlining thing where, you know, God's going to take care of you. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm not going to worry about it because the second coming is going to happen and I'll be fine. But unfortunately, I've seen uh, in the stories, a lot of people are suffering from that. You know, ones that have left that have a, a loved one or a friend who's still in the church and who's ill and not taking care of themselves because, you know, they're waiting for God to take care of them and, and believing mm -hmm. in what Pac's saying, the second coming's happening. Did well, Worldwide Church of God eventually get rid of that or yeah, is, that is it just Pac still continuing it? Yeah, that eventually at least... Um calm down, you know, because, uh, you know, it's easy to say not to get a doctor when you're healthy. Uh, but when Herbert Armstrong needed one, he got one. He took drugs. They, you know, I have friends that said, yeah, we see the prescription bottles in the trash. Um, Mark may have more to say about uh, Mr. Pack personally, but he has health problems. Uh, he has a doctor. 
from what I understand. He's been in the hospital and he keeps it quiet. He, uh, a couple of feasts ago, I, I heard him mocking uh, other people for being protecting themselves from COVID. Uh, he was making fun at his festival site of the people next door who were another one of the splinters and that he wanted to go in there and open the door and breathe on him. And the whole congregation was laughing. And he got home from that particular festival and spent nine weeks with COVID. And it was all he could do to tell the church he got COVID. And now Mark may know more about that, but that's the way I understand it. Yes, um, the Living Church of God, their, uh, their feast services were across the hall and you're correct. I remember uh, hearing him say that in the sermon that I wound up processing at headquarters. But it was ironic that he would tease them and joke with them by, we're just going to sing louder because they weren't allowed to sing over at Living and they were wearing masks during services and RCG had a very strict no, we don't want to wear a mask because we don't have mm -hmm. to. It was ironic that then Dave Pack got, got the COVID. But going back to your other could, point, I'm sorry, go it ahead. All he could, it was all he could do to tell the church he got COVID. <laughs> well, uh, well, that was a big secret hush-hush for a long time. Yeah. Um, because I remember uh, back at headquarters, the, after the feast, one of the head ministers goes up to the front of the room and he said, don't worry, everybody, Mr. and Mrs. Pack are fine. And the moment he said that, I thought, oh, they have COVID. Because if they didn't have COVID, that minister would have gone up there and said, they don't have COVID. So when he said Mr. and Mrs. Pack are, quote, fine, I knew they had COVID. And then, of course, Dave Pack is holed up, and then he found some way to turn it into a biblical, that oh, God right. did this for him, because now he's the type of Ezekiel who shut up in his house for so many weeks, because now he could think and study and blah, blah, blah. So Dave Pack has a wonderful way. He's very much like Russell Crowe in that movie, A Beautiful Mind, where there's a bunch of Bible verses up on a wall and he can just see the patterns. He sees the, how everything connects like nobody else can see. And that whole COVID experience is just another example of how everything is prophecy and everything in the Bible relates back to David C. Pat. Well, and that's, that's a good point you bring up. I wanted to mention that uh, Dave uh, certainly sees himself in the scriptures. That's your first hint. Something is very wrong psychologically. Uh, secondly, he's not trained. He's no better trained than I was. He went to the same school, but he will uh, make scripture mean what it never meant. It's all I can do to listen to some of his sermons just to see what's going on. They make no sense. They jump from one scripture to the next. Um, and my conclusion is that, that to say I'm mistaken, I'm sorry, I was wrong, let's move on to something else is, is impossible for Mr. Pack to do. And every time he's wrong and it's weekly, um, I, I always got a kick out of, uh, he will say, I have finally discovered, I have finally seen, God has finally shown me when it's a positive thing and he gives a sermon on why that's true and then it's not true like the following tuesday and he gives another sermon and he says we never understood it we and then he includes the congregation like they had something to do with the fact that he was wrong to begin with and uh it's it's a psychological problem <laughs> it's it's a wonderful tactic he uses i i equate it to him throwing people under the bus he throws the ministry under the bus all the time all That's the ministers agree. None of the other ministers saw it. I'm the, you know, I'm working here all by myself. I'm an apostle. I wish I could be with the other apostles. And, you know, these are good men. Oh, really good men. And, but yet they're not helpful to him. And, and quite frankly, those men in there are not going to raise their hand and say, Mr. Pack, you're wrong. Because no. I know from men who would try to nudge, knew things were going on, knew they were uncomfortable, tried to nudge David Pack in a different direction or bring up verses that don't match his teaching. And those men got in trouble. They had a talking to by the other senior men. So mm -hmm. those men know when he's talking, just keep your mouth shut, nod and agree. And that's what they do at headquarters. Well, and I too, I've, as I say, I've listened to a lot of the sermons. They are so convoluted and confusing that I, I can guarantee anybody that no minister, if a member said, could you explain to me what Mr. Pack said last week? I don't think they'd be able to do it because it's different than what was said the week before, but it's so convoluted and uh, disjointed. And if there's ever a lesson in making the Bible mean what it never meant or could mean or will mean, um, Mr. Pack is a master at it. But unfortunately it uh, affects people's lives because they believe it until 
maybe they learned the hard way they shouldn't have. Now, moving into that, um, on the website for his bio, going through it, um, and then looking at other blogs, you will see a lot of uh, different stories in regards to events from the past. Um, one of them is um, about a letter, and it basically stated that what is remarkable, however, is how often Pac's name seems to appear um, with the tragedies in Worldwide Church of God. For a number of years, no Worldwide Church of God minister has appeared more often and written to reports complaining about ministerial abuse. Um, basically, it goes on the following 13 pages of the letter, the allegations about Pack read like a horror story. The author contended that Pack constantly intimidates members, uses threats, mind control methods, is given to extreme emotional outbursts, is highly political, believes in winning at all costs, has disfellowed members for trivial faults, prescribes diets with playing MD, enjoys putting down women, and told one married woman with children, it would be better for you to shack up one night with a man than to wear makeup. The letter quotes Pack as of having said, everyone who has challenged me either died been seriously injured or has been eliminated from the work and God backs me even if I'm wrong. Have you heard of this letter? Totally. <laughs> and uh, that's the Dave I know. That's the Mr. Pack that I know. Now, I, you know, the details, um, those letters, I think, are written by members of churches that he's pastored. But those traits have followed him uh, from every church that he's ever been assigned to. And my during my time, I, I would talk to people, you know, that I knew and say, why does the church put up with this? You know, the corporate church, why can you not get fired? Can you not be talked to? Can you not be uh, told you better straighten up? Uh, I do know that back uh, at one time when uh, Buffalo was a, quite a traumatic thing that Mr. Pack inflicted on Buffalo, evidently, and um, uh, he was sent to New York City which he greatly resented, to work under another pastor who was basically charged with giving him one more chance, straightening him out. And uh, Mr. Pack took that as a demotion, and he'll, he'll talk about that. I've heard him talk about that in kind of a bitter way. But they were just simply trying to rein him in and give him some instruction on how to be a church pastor, which I thought was very merciful, because up to that point, most people would have been terminated. And um, I talked to the fellow that was in charge of kind of overseeing Dave's progress in that year that he was in New York City. And I said, how's he doing? And that fellow said, well, he's, he's doing fine. He said, but he'll go right back to being what he always does once he leaves here. And that's the truth. And people don't change. They go underground. They comply until they can get where they want to go. I mean, that's just common to people. So yeah, those things are, I'm sure are true. And those, whether the details, I don't know. I wasn't in that area. But those characteristics are absolutely um, how Mr. Peck has always come across to the ministry and to everybody that knows him. I, uh, I guess I'll tell this to uh, my dad and my parents took care of his children, babysat his children in Rochester when he was there. And um, it, it, it was told, you know, that his wife told my father, you know, Fred, it's not easy being married to David Peck. Um, because, and I can't imagine it would be. Um, so uh, it's, it's difficult. In the bio, it mentioned um, when he was out east in, in the churches there that he came into people who were possessed and that he had to cast the demons out. Mm -hmm. Is this something that Worldwide Church of God did? It sounds almost something as if, you know, it's Catholic, you know, like mm -hmm. possession, but. I don't understand how somebody is a basic minister can decide that somebody's possessed with a demon, just like um, Mrs. Elliot, who obviously had her own mental issues and unfortunately took the life of her daughter. Um, he didn't tell her to go seek help. He nothing. He just said right. she was possessed by a demon. This person's possessed by a demon. How, how explain that? Well, Dave, um, there were the teaching in the church was not 
uh, universal on that, you know, but there were men that I knew that almost like they bragged on specializing in casting out demons, kind of like a Catholic priest. Um, first of all, let, please understand there's no such thing. Every case of, of those types of behaviors in people are simply mental illnesses for which they need professional help um, or, um, yeah whatever, but uh, the, the fact that they're demon-possessed. I'll tell a personal story. When uh, Mr. Pack was uh, the pastor in Rochester, my sister's children, my nieces, were um, babies, and they were on the floor on the blanket during the sermon that Mr. Pack was giving, and my sister tells me that uh, he took her aside. They were making a fuss, the children, during one of his sermons, and took my sister aside and said that your children are demon-possessed because they were interrupting my sermon. They're just kids, they're babies, <laughs> you know, they're on the floor. But the, Dave prides himself uh, as being probably the minister that's not only baptized more people than anybody on the whole planet, which is not true, uh, but has cast out more demons than anybody on the planet, which is also not true. But uh, um, so it kind of went, depending on some ministers, they got real serious about that stuff. And um, again, I, I personally would never claim to have done that. And it didn't take me many years before I realized, you know, we're dealing with mental illness. And I've taken people to counselors and I've told them they need help. And I've seen some strange behaviors in mental hospitals, but it's not demons. It's uh, ailments <laughs> that come to people. So uh, it kind of depended on the minister. Um, now, uh, David C. Pack that. claims that his restored Church of God is the one true extension of Mr. Armstrong's ministry, the church in which Christ is now working and considers himself an apostle. Yeah, absolutely. And Dave, Dave appointed himself an apostle. Nobody made him one. He gave a four hour sermon years ago, again, convoluting himself through all the scriptures. And then at the end said, and therefore, yes, brethren, I am an apostle. So he just made himself an apostle. Um, whatever that means. Uh, of course, Dave, and I've got some quotes here, but I've taken too long to find them. Um, he is the one true church. There is no church outside of restored church of God that's a real church. There are no Christians outside of the restored church of God that are real Christians. And mind you, he only has about 1,500 members. So on a planet of 7 billion people, um, that's pretty arrogant. But uh, on the other hand, every church I've ever been associated with, uh, either this one or one growing up, nobody says, well, I know I go to the wrong church. I go to the false church. Everybody goes to the true church. But, but Mr. Pack will make it very plain that if you're not in the restored church of God, you're not, you don't even know God. You can't possibly, and, and also what you'll find, you can search long and hard to find where Mr. Pack talks about Jesus. Uh, the, G, there's a Christ, you know, which is kind of a creature that he's invented. Um, but Jesus, New Testament, the Gospels, very, very little of his ministry has anything to do with what we would classically call Jesus of Christianity. Uh, David soaks in the Old Testament. Again, he, he sees himself in it. He's sure that Jesus is coming back or Christ is coming back shortly. Um, about every week, and he's wrong every week. Um, it's it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to me that a man can <clears throat> be so wrong so often and uh, not see it or admit it. Or maybe at the height of Worldwide Church of God, how many members were there compared to? Because we're looking at like you know around fifteen hundred for restored, but Worldwide Church was way bigger. Yeah, well, during the time of, of Worldwide Church of God. At any one time, there might be 150,000 active members. But um, again, with one of my contacts, I was told who would know that in the course of the Worldwide Church of God, over 500,000 people passed through its doors. And that's people who became part of the church and left the church. Over 500,000 people came in and went out over from the 1930s on. Uh, it's, it's astounding. You know, but it, but it was when I was a pastor. From the moment I went into the ministry, it was one scandal after the next. It was very difficult to pastor a church um, when you when you're dealing with all this craziness. 
And it always had to do with money or uh, all the things that televangelists get involved with, the ego, um, the thinking they're far more special than everybody else. And of course, you know, what's, what's being done with the money? And most people I know who are the one man show who run their own circus, their attitude is always, it's none of your business. Once you give it, that's my choice, my decision. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers that for you. Now, do you believe in our discussions that uh, David Pack is a danger to his followers and the things that he preaches? Yes, he's already been a danger to them. He's a danger to their finances. He's a danger to their relationships, whether it's family or marriage or children. Um, yeah, he's a danger to anybody that comes in contact with him. I don't think he's a danger to the community other than that I believe the day will come where the people of Wadsworth may be a little embarrassed of what the headlines say. I don't know. Um, but at this rate, um, I think Wadsworth has every right to ask what's going on. Uh, what's going on with this? Um, but yes, no, he's a very, definitely a danger to anybody that thinks to join the church um, or to be a part of the church. And again, I'm sure Mark has many more modern, more up-to-date uh, examples of that. Uh, but to join the restored church of God is to give up critical thinking and just go with what you're told. And frankly, what you're told is not true. There's no truth in it. There's no truth in the vast majority. Did Herbert Armstrong set dates like David Pack is? No, not like this. No, there were some general, you know, they, they wrote a book on 1975 in prophecy, and it was not meant to say that that was the date Jesus would return, but it was taken that way. Um, all I ever heard was from some of the higher up ministers that Jesus would, and we kidded about it, he, it would be three to five years, um, 10 at the most, 20 max, you know, and personally, I find that uh a pastor who is really into the falsity of uh, when they think they can predict Jesus is coming back usually ties it into about their own lifespan. You know, just like the Apostle Paul was just dead sure that Jesus was coming in his lifetime. He said, We who are alive and remain uh, sh shall not die you know, until he comes. And then, of course, at the end, when the jig is up, as they say, um, he said, Well, I fought a good fight, I finished the course gotta go <laughs> you know but usually uh, uh the the predictions don't extend much beyond the lifetime of the person predicting it because they think they're going to be alive now with the history of uh restored church of god they haven't participated in community things they don't they don't really they they just keep to themselves um and it came out that after the first two episodes that recently and they've been members of the the city's chamber of commerce for years um but nobody's really attended anything and they recently had representatives show up and um want to do an invitation on their property and i'm taking that as possibly damage control um since PAC is aging and his prophecies aren't coming and with him having representatives all of a sudden after all this time finally try to do something in the community where do you think he's headed what do you think the future is is holding at this point well i think that's exactly right what you said it's damage control the philosophy of of the churches and and again mark can correct me if it's changed is that uh, my kingdom's not of this world um, money is to be better spent preaching the gospel you know i would dare say if um, wadsworth had a tornado you wouldn't get a penny from uh, the restored church of god unless they felt somehow we got to do something to look like we're not really the way we are uh, that would be a waste of money uh, that's the world um, where i think it's headed i think david pack as everybody else will age and die uh, i don't believe that uh, there's anybody really that's going to want to carry on after him his children are not available they they are not supportive of of his uh, perspective so i've kidded maybe it's not a joke ultimately i think that campus will either be sold to another evangelical megachurch and they'll love it they'll take over from there it's already pre-done 
or it'll become a drug rehab center. <laughs> I don't, I don't look for a good, good future for the property um, once Mr. Peck uh, dies. And I believe, with all my heart, like every human being, he will grow old and die. And none of what he is invested in, and none of what those people are investing in, is ever going to happen. And, and yet, that'll be something they recognize in hindsight, just as we recognize that Herbert Armstrong for 40, 50 years good intentions maybe, or that was his perspective, but he was wrong, terribly wrong. And people have stories of, boy, you know, I look back on my own life and, and still am struck with what was I thinking? What on earth was I thinking? And yet I know when I was young, you couldn't have talked me out of it. And now that I'm 72 years old, it's like, what was I thinking? You know, where they say too soon old, too late smart. What is your advice for people that are current members that deep in their heart, they're on the fence about whether they're staying or to go? Um, people ask me all the time, why, why is it that, you know, we think people stay? And it's kind of like if somebody's in an abusive relationship, um, people ask the same thing. They, it's change. They're embarrassed. They're scared. They don't know what's going to be after that. Um, to also like a soldier coming home with PTSD and things. Um, what is your advice to those people that we know that are listening that want to leave, but they're scared to leave or those that have left, but I don't want to say ashamed. They're just, they're just still overwhelmed with the emotion of everything that they went through to, to talk about it. Well, first understand that transitions are messy. They're very messy and we need to understand. Um, I would recommend, you know, I've always told people, if your head tells you one thing, I should stay. I don't want to go in the lake of fire. Maybe this is right. I've invested so much. I can't leave, but your stomach tells you something else. I don't agree with this. This is confusing. This changes every week. Your stomach is telling you the truth and your head is lying to you. And so, you know, I would like to see people critically think and not be afraid, not be driven by fear or guilt or shame, all of which are the motivating factors for staying in the church. Uh, a, a member might think, well, I've invested so much. Well, not near as much as you're going to invest if you stay there, you know, cut your losses. And if you don't believe it, man up, you know, uh, what I tell people too, is if, you, if on the inside, you're standing up, you know, I believe this, but, but I can't say anything. And the outside, you're sitting down, you're being compliant. Until the inside and the outside match, you're going to be miserable. And so I, I would just say, when in doubt, leave. There's nothing's going to hurt you. You're not in trouble. You're not going into the lake of fire. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not in the one true church that if you leave, um, you have left the one true church. It's not true. It is not true. There are many fine Christian churches available to you. Um, and the entire message of the New Testament is not the message of the restored church of God. It just isn't. And so, um, you know, I wish somebody had pushed me a lot harder back in the day, but I also recognize that until you recognize it from the inside, what other people say doesn't matter. Uh, you couldn't have talked me out of it until I talked myself out of it, until I realized this is crazy. I didn't sign up for this and I'm not going to keep it going. So do not be motivated by fear of what will happen to you if you leave, because nothing will happen to you, except you might get a smile on your face. You might understand what freedom means, and you might make your own decisions. Uh, guilt, there's nothing to be guilty about. And shame, that's just a motivator that are probably guilt and shame are probably the two worst motivators of human beings on the planet that are useless, absolutely useless. So I, I would encourage you, you know, make the inside. When you're sitting there in a sermon and it's confusing or it's different than last week or here we go again and that bothers you, let it bother you and then do something. Reclaim your life. Your life does not belong to Restored Church of God. Your finances don't belong to David C. Pack. So, um, but it's tough. It is tough. It took me... I was, I knew I was not going to last for several years while I stayed in the ministry. 
and people criticize you for that as if you could decide on Tuesday that you're done with it and then Wednesday you can go do something else. So it's a very difficult transition. I've counseled with ministers who've been in the same position who didn't want to get divorced. They knew if they, if they left the church, they don't believe it anymore. If they left the church, their wife or husband would divorce them. So what do I do? You know, I don't want that to happen. And all I could say is, well, I can't guarantee that won't happen. I can't guarantee your children will say, oh, good, dad, you're gonna, not going to be a minister. I can't guarantee you won't have financial difficulties until you get on your feet again. But, but the day will come where you look back and say, you know, that wasn't so bad because I got my brains back. I got my self-worth back. I got my own opinion back. I got my smile back. And uh, you'll look back on it and say, I, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe that I did that. Or I thought that way. Or I allowed others to teach me to think that way. It takes time. It takes time. Do you have a message for the current ministers that are part of Restored Church of God? And talking to Mark, um, he says they know what they're doing is, I want to say, isn't right. It just, it, it shouldn't be happening from, you know, getting them to hand over common, extra, extra finances, extra money, believe in the rigmarole that PAC has put out, which basically all the material originated from Herbert Armstrong. He just changed a little and put his name on it. I feel that PAC, in, in talking to others, have told me that Restored Church of God wouldn't be able to run if he didn't have his ministers going around helping him. Do you have a message for them, for many that are on the fence or that keep pursuing and following what PAC is telling them to do when it's not right? Um, absolutely, I, because I've been through that, not with Mr. Pack, but with Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Tkach. And, and so I've been through that process. It's, it's a painful process. It takes time. Um, I understand being a pastor where you're not quite on the, on, the, on the boat, but you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. Uh, I, I understand that if you're on that campus and you have a nice house and you've been given a nice house and you can stay in that house as long as you toe the line, uh, there's pressure there. But um, I, don't, I guess I don't have time to, to read it. Um, but several years ago, Dave Peck was taking, um, gave, us, gave a questionnaire to ministers that wanted to come into the church from other churches, from other worldwide churches, uh, Church of Gods. He had this ridiculous um, thing that, you know, do you, do you repent of your craziness? And, and do you believe that you can criticize me? Um, on a scale of one to five, are you faithless and evil? And uh, he wanted this checklist of them just crushing their own selves at his feet um, so he could decide whether they'd be worthy enough to be a minister in, in the restored church of God. It was just insane. It's, uh, it's online. Yeah, you can find it, um, his little quiz. But um, I can't imagine that the ministry even understands what Dave is talking about. I can understand getting stuck and wondering, what do I do now? I can't, Dave will always say that my men agreed with me, everybody agreed with me, they all agree with me. I don't believe it for a minute. It's just that the price of disagreeing is very high, very high, and they're not willing to do it yet. But the day will come where it'll get so difficult that they'll do it because they have to. So I would say there are probably true believers in the ministry. And there are probably people who have doubts. So true believers, you can't help. But those who have doubts, pursue them. Those who um, um, just get your life back. Get your life back. I can't believe that the ministry understands even half of what Dave Pack is saying. Could explain it to a member and thinks it's okay. Thinks it's absolutely okay to week after week after week make new predictions that fail and fail and fail and fail and not finally realize this is nuts. This is insane. I'm not gonna put up with this anymore. It's embarrassing and, and it's uh, destructive. It'll, it'll, um, it'll last the rest of your life, believe me. And you will wonder, what, were, what was I thinking? And the, and the bottom line is you weren't. You weren't thinking, you were maintaining.
Well, I want to thank you so much for being a guest. I, from the bottom of my heart, I am so glad that I got to meet you and talk to you. Um, I think this is an example for other ministers out there, other people out there that you can grow as a person. You you don't have to stay in, in the world that is untrue, makes you unhappy. Uh, I think you've done a wonderful job. I loved hearing the story of you going out to lunch and, and still keeping in contact with people because I, that's what it's all about. That's when you know that you're healing, that you're moving forward, that you realize that those friendships are more important um, and, and finding peace. I, I truly believe that uh, what you have said is going to speak to some people out there. I really hope that uh, the viewers out there from Restore Church of God or any of the splinters or any church that is, is facing a basic one-man show, um, that there's more out there and, and open up your eyes like Dennis has. Um, you're very humble. Um, I'm very grateful for your story. Um, I've read your blogs. I will attach the link so people can see that, so they can also see the documentary series, which I thought all the gentlemen did an amazing job on. Um, and, and coming from past experience of, you know, dealing with things in my own life, you know, you got to take things one day at a time. That's it's right. just one day at a time. I know that it's scary to open up your eyes and, and have to take that first step forward. But that's what we're doing this series for is to educate people. And I still invite David C. Pack to come and do an interview and, and explain some things as you wish. Um, hopefully we can have you as a guest again, Dennis. You were amazing. Um, oh, thank you. I love history and you have given us a great amount, especially as somebody that went to Ambassador College, um, was around at Herbert Armstrong's time and also that you're still maintaining friendships, which is amazing. And thank you, Mark, for um, being involved again. And to our viewers, if you have any questions, please feel free to post comments and we will try to get them answered for you. Until next time, have a great day. watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.